technology. So, all right, we don't have a gavel, but we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. There we are. I believe the clerk is calling a silent roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, which uh, we will be advised when we get one more member, and we will take action on the minute, uh, the minutes at that point. But we'll go ahead and get the uh, the meeting started today. Our microphones are on the uh, ceilings here, I'm told. It's very appropriate for our topic today. We've got artificial intelligence microphones. They're on if they're green, so everything you say is being streamed across the world. Uh, we, The clerk just informed me that a quorum is present, so I'll recognize the co-chair to move the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we approve the minutes from our meeting of April 17th, 2023. Motion before the committee is on the adoption of the minutes. Is there discussion on that motion? If not, question before the committee is on adoption of the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Please say no. I said that the minutes are adopted. Our first speaker this morning, our topic this morning here at uh, Marshall University, I want to thank everybody here for having us, by the way. Uh, beautiful campus. Uh, it's been a wonderful visit so far, short for me thus far, but uh, looking forward to it. It's understanding emerging trends in artificial intelligence, which I hope everybody will find topical and interesting. We have some very good speakers today, first of which is Scott Swan, who is with us this morning. He is a native West Virginian. I will uh, uh, allow him to introduce himself, as I'm sure he can do it better, and I know he has a slide deck for us. Those should be in your packets as well. Uh, and we'll look forward to hearing from everybody. What we'll do is uh, go through the presentations um, and then we will go ahead and field questions after uh, each presenter goes uh, and then um, allow the next one to go. And if we need to circle back on questions, then we'll do that as well. But with no further, Mr. Swan, <coughs> it's all yours. <coughs> Well, thank you, um, Elegant Capito and committee members for allowing me to, to speak today. And with that introduction on AI and the speakers here, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to give some justice to this. But I don't want to talk too much about my company or myself, but it's probably important that you understand who I am. Um, name is Scott Swan, um, born in Doddridge County, uh, worked at the FBI for about 14 years in West Virginia. Uh, went off to the Director of National Intelligence to lead uh, biometrics and identity programs there, uh, and then um, went uh, three years to the FBI Director's Office where I spawned across both Director Mueller and Director Comey. Um, I went out to work at the largest biometric identity company in the world. At that time it was Morpho, later became Idemia. Um, probably just lost some credibility there with some people. Uh, but um, I decided I wanted to go work for a U.S.-based company, and now I'm the CEO of Brand One Computing. Um, so, with that quick intro of who I am, um, the reason why I was really kind of excited to talk to you guys today was, uh, as you look across the news, you can see AI has kind of really dominated the press here in the past month or so um, since the release of Chat ChatGPT, and you have world leaders and technology that are speaking up about concerns. And as a Judiciary Committee, you know, it's inevitable at some point in time, you will probably uh, need to start thinking about some rulemaking in this space. And so as I talk to you, uh, really what the message is I want to portray to you is just to give you a little bit better understanding. You know, not all AI is bad, but there are absolutely things you should probably be concerned about. And I wanted to kind of maybe provide some of my thoughts at least about where I think you guys may want to steer some of those thoughts as you move forward. You may need to start thinking about some rule, rule making in this particular space. I'm sure that you'll be able to follow some national trends, uh, but um, I think you know typically at the local and the state levels, they, they they're, they're able to get things accomplished much faster than we can at the federal level. Uh, my background obviously is mostly on the federal space, uh, so I'm actually just learning a little bit more about the state politics, which I actually enjoy. Um, so you'll hear a lot of buzzwords and artificial intelligence. In fact, some of these newer words, I've been working in this space for some amount of time, and they're new to me. And I think they can get really, really confusing about what artificial intelligence is. The particular area that I have expertise in and that I worked in most of my career was what they referred to as computer vision. Um, computer vision is a kind of machine learning, and uh, trust me, I, this is probably the most technical I'll talk in this entire presentation. I don't want to keep it very technical. but 
computer vision just means if I could see it, then I could probably write algorithms uh, or train algorithms that can actually automate that process. And in this particular space, um, there were two methodologies, sort of legacy methodology called machine learning, where you know, typically you might have a person that looks at, say, a face. Uh, and they say, first of all, it's a yes to question. Is this a face or is this not a face? Then they may say, help me find where the two eyes are on this face. And the people will manually mark those two eyes and they'll, they'll um, be able to start marking different points on the face to the point where you can start training machines to find all this stuff. Um, so that was the traditional way of doing it. Now, in deep learning, which is starting to make its way into what you uh, see in ChatGPT and other things. You just feed these algorithms a lot of information and they start learning themselves. And so the more information that you give them, the more accurate that they'll be. And then they'll just really impress you with what they're able to do at that point. But deep learning isn't in itself something that you can regulate because it is now become widespread across all different sorts of artificial intelligence. So that's not the starting place for where rulemaking needs to, to probably um, go in, into place. What I believe is where there probably needs to be more focus is the origin of the artificial intelligence. Um, having worked for a foreign uh, company before and understanding um, from my federal background, some of the security division um, concerns about different types of technologies. Um, we'll always talk a lot about cyber, and <coughs> cyber's I think been around long enough that people are starting to understand, you know, um, how we're ranks and all those different types of things. The difference between the concerns about artificial intelligence and cyber are that um, now you're talking about the the engine itself that motors a, a lot of systems that we have, and what kind of damage could it actually do? Even if it's not a really sensitive system, you know, what kind of damage could it do? And um, I will use a, an example. Um, poison artificial intelligence is, is what sometimes people will refer this to. But, but, um, you can think about a use case where an autonomous car could be trained to understand what a stop sign looks like, what the stop sign it knows that you're supposed to stop. But what if someone who trained that artificial intelligence decided to um, add a special rule in there that says, if you see a yellow sticky note on a stop sign, accelerate, turn right, and cause a crash. Problem with that is um, when we worked, when I was at the FBI, uh, we bought foreign technology. We decided at that time we would treat it as a black box. And we didn't really care as long as it did what we thought it was supposed to do, then we could test that and we could determine that we would use that technology. Um, and when security division learned that we were buying a foreign technology, they essentially said, no, 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 no way. You can't do that. Um, you need to, um, there's a lot of concerns in that particular space, rightfully so. Um, so what we put in place was a vulnerability assessment lab. We were looking for back doors. We were looking for make sure that there was no issues in the code and that we could kind of do source code scanning of the code, all those types of things. That's something typically that you would do with, uh, to, to have a good cyber posture to do that. Um, the problem is, is that um, if you train these kind of algorithms, then you have the power to put these embedded rules that it's a black box. So no one is actually going to be able to scan for that and be able to make sense to say that, um, you know, hey, how would you ever test to know that a yellow sticky tab was that trigger to make sure that a autonomous car turns right? Right. So as you think about these types of poison AI attacks, what can you rely on as you think about rules? And I, I would say you really need to understand and trust the people who build your artificial intelligence. You know, um, by USA is always, uh, uh, I think, a uh, starting place in that space. Um, it's not always been the case that we had that option. Um, in, in a lot of cases, this is an area where the US has fallen behind. And you may be surprised to hear, you know, my background is biometrics. And I, after 9-11, I, I went to New York, served in the, um, at, at the World Trade Center, helping identify victims. 
Um, I worked on presidential directives to try to assist in better you know, posture in place so that we could um, you know, have a, a great national infrastructure. Um, that infrastructure is made up of FBI, Department of Defense, Department of State, the intelligence community, just several government agencies with your up here, screening center, the National Counterterrorism Counter Center. When you think about the algorithms that power that system, it's 100% foreign technology. We're 100% dependent on foreign technology for deciding if people come into this country uh, that potentially could have been bomb makers in another country. You know, you'll hear me reference mostly national security things because that's my background. Um, but you know, we we automated as part of um, you know the people who were in the Middle East. Um, thousands and thousands of fingerprints that were helping make bombs. People don't realize that there's been thousands of attempts of people to try to come into this country that's actually made the bombs. Um, we rely on this technology for a variety of things. Uh, and so national screening to get into the country is just one example. Across the state, you guys use this technology in a lot of spaces. To drill down just a little bit more on a use case, Guys are probably very familiar with how department motor vehicles work, um, maybe very familiar with passports. When you think about the security of each one of those, you know, which one is more secure as a credential? Um, there's a big loophole in the way that we do passports today. We have, um, we allow people to provide their own photo. What's wrong with that? There's also artificial intelligence that can take two separate people and they call this morphing and they can create an identity of somebody that doesn't really exist but look at that picture on the far right that is a combination of features from both of those two other individuals it looks like a real person right um, there's a lot of research programs to try to detect this it's a it's a very hard problem to solve nobody's solved this problem yet um, this may not be the best example but if you take two people who look kind of close to one another, the, the problem with that is, is that you can create a passport that two people can use. Um, as a security officer, or a TS, TSA officer, you can look at this passport and you can see the features of me and you say, okay, that's probably him. And you let, let, let that go. Um, so if, if there's a gap there and you allow somebody else to control the engine of searching against this type of information. It's very easy for me to create a rule set for everybody in this room. I can create the, the most advanced face recognition capability in, in, the, in the world, um, but I could have special rules for every one of you that said, when I see you, I wanted to do something different. So this is where it kind of gets a little bit concerning. And even as you think about your state systems and you think about, I think I would invite you to kind of black team these things to, to try to think about if someone controlled the algorithms or the black box that I depend on to run these systems, could they cause any kind of harm? Um, <clears throat> as you fast forward that into you know, what could you potentially do as a, as a judiciary committee, you can think about you know the way that source selections are conducted within your state. And you can think about, you know, um, is there enough competition that you can have a requirement to say uh, that you require U.S.-based companies to do that. Um, maybe you don't. In certain cases, when, when I was at FBI, at that particular time, there weren't U.S. companies to actually choose from. We had to go to foreign technologies. But that's changing a little bit, especially because of deep learning. It makes it possible for other companies to get into this space. Um, but you can also, um, if there's not enough competition in that space, you can, you can waive source selections so that you can you know, have special provision or at a minimum, you can require foreign companies that they're going to provide you technology to explain more broadly how they built their artificial intelligence. Now they'll be resistant to doing that, but um, they certainly will do that if you make it as a requirement to, to actually build out your systems. So we talked a little bit about what's inside the black box. You know, as, as you can imagine, it's just really difficult to, to really understand. Uh, we also talked about um, from a cyber perspective, you know, we, we hear about solar winds, we hear about ransomware, we hear about all these other activities. You can test those much, much differently than you can um, artificial intelligence and what's going on there. Now, there's, I think, 
when you think about the chat GBT and what's going on in the press right now, you know, that's what a lot of people are concerned about. It's just, you know, can you train algorithms? And this doesn't have to be national security. You can think about education. You know, would you want people who, um, you know, dominated the topic of critical race theory to um, train algorithms to, um, to pr provide um, capabilities within education? You know, probably not, right? So you probably want to really understand the company and the individuals who are making your artificial intelligence and, you know, probably put a, additional um, gates in place before you allow them to do business with the state. Um, that's that's one of the main themes that I really want to get by. Um, but probably enough gloom and doom about the uh, artificial intelligence. There's also just a, a bright future for West Virginia in this particular space. Um, there's just so many different um, areas. You're already using it. I mean, it's it's widespread within the state for sure, and it's it's going only going to become you know broader spread as we talk about national security. There's the last point that I forgot to make, but I really wanted to, to drive this home is that if we get our heads wrapped around China, Russia, China, Russia all the time, right? Those are adversaries. China has made a, a strong claim that AI is the war that they want to win. And it's a scary thought to think about everything they can do in that particular space. And as we make investments in foreign companies, one thing that we have to understand about supply chain is that France's relationship with China and Russia is much different than the United States' relationship with China and Russia. Their ability to get um, foreign people working on their algorithms is, is much different than what we allow in this particular state. I mean, you see this in the news, right? You watch and you see that there's even at the highest levels that there's meetings taking place that makes you, you know, a little bit concerned just at the political level. But if you think about the company levels and what happens in those spaces, you know, what prohibits a French company from going and getting Chinese code? You know, in bargain and it performs well, they're going to do that unless you put provisions in place to stop them from doing that. So you can add provisions into your source selections also that make sure that you understand all origins of, of where code comes from and, and really kind of dig down into that, those particular places. Um, within the state, though, um, education is one place that we've been very fairly active at, and you know it's definitely been uh, large in the news. I think you know the use case that I uh, have been focusing on here as of late is um, visitor management systems. You know, today, you know, 99% of the time, 100% of the time, most of the schools that I've visited, they have some kind of a visitor button, and if someone rings that button, they usually get through the door. And, um, you know, this technology, instead of just having an admin that's looking at a video feed that they can, you know, oftentimes barely see, uh, or just getting an audio message, you know, just having a camera there that gives them a little bit more context about who they're dealing with, you know. Um, that ability to, uh, if you have a vendor coming in, sending out a message to the vendor, having them do just a little bit of information, verify their identity. Then when they get to the school, they can have a very frictionless experience. It's not so much about enrolling students here to protect the students that you need to think about. It's about the other threats that you have that you probably really want to be concerned about. Um, so, you know, the ability to, um, you know, face recognition is one area. You can add sex offenders. You can add you know, wants, warrants, not just within the state, but all the states. You'd be surprised what kind of success you have in that. But it's not just base. There's so many other opportunities. Weapons detection, you can create weapons detection algorithms. You know, just, you know, as we look at some of these shootings, there's been a lot of preparation out in the parking lots. I've been surprised at the quality of cameras that you have in your schools around this area. Um, that is, uh, it's not a super mature technology, but it works good enough, you know. And I think it's important that, that People understand not only the rulemaking side, but you know to what extent can you rely on technology uh, to help sure things up. Uh, there's not necessarily a silver bullet for schools, right? There's a lot of different types of technology that you probably want to put in place to help better protect those those kinds of students. So I think you know as you think about deploying video analytics at schools as a whole, it's new new territory. Um, there are some schools that's done some things. But I always talk about the adoption of technology is that if you really want to stay out of trouble, it's very important that you document the way that you're going to use that, not just think about, um, you know, what what it can prevent, but put a proper procedure in place. You know,
Think about your privacy impact assessments, your privacy threshold assessments. Think about how to put those things in place so that if you do find yourself in a press release and the ACLU starts calling, you have some posture to, to lean back on and say, I will allow this technology to do this. I don't allow this technology to do that. And I think that's pretty important across the board as you think about the use of artificial intelligence, whether that's in schools or other areas within the state. Public safety, you know, we're working in some smart cities across the globe. Um, we're going to do some work with Elkins, West Virginia, it looks like, to, to help them, you know, do some automation. This could be from a license plate recognition capability. It doesn't have to be face recognition. It can also just be to set rules to say, um, in this particular area, if there's the, a person, you don't even have to know who the person is. You don't have to do face recognition. Just detect that it's a silhouette of a person. If there's somebody here between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, I want to notify law enforcement so they look at this camera and just do a little bit of vetting to see if they need to put somebody out there on site because there should be nobody there at those particular times. Artificial intelligence can easily do that. You know, we talk about cameras, security cameras, they're ubiquitous and you they're, they're a great deterrent to see a camera, but nobody has the time to look at all this footage. Typically cameras come into play when something bad has already happened and they're trying to go back to actually investigate it. Now artificial intelligence can help in that as well. My, my last assignment at the FBI was the Boston Marathon bombing. That was the first time that we opened our hip lines to the public and we were inundated with how much help they wanted to provide us. And regardless of what you might see in the news, there's really no automation at that time to help support quickly trying to find out who these brothers were. They were acting by themselves. There were other associates. I think it opened up a lot more what if questions and concerns than it did anything else. Um, in fact, uh, it's interesting, just a data point on my current employee company, the founders at that time worked for me when I was at FBI, and we did a major issue study on that to try to understand what the roadmap should be for the FBI. Um, I always knew those guys would be successful, and they, they went on to, um, to help build some of these technologies out um, to, to be able to help support those kind of use cases. But um, just as, as kind of a summary there, you know, these kind of technologies, instead of just having a post-process camera that will um, you know, react after something bad has already happened, uh, it can be the trigger, whether that be at a school or, um, you know, finding out that, that car that's been stolen or, you know, just a business rule that we have set. Um, it's very powerful. There's not enough, um, certainly we don't want to use this technology to replace jobs, especially in West Virginia, but there's certainly not enough to be empowered to look at all this type of stuff. Um, as you think about AI, you know, it doesn't get tired and it's going to be consistent with all the results. It, it doesn't have personality or emotions, so you don't have to worry about that. So those types of mistakes that sometimes happen for humans, they, they won't happen. There are areas that you can rely on this technology, but you have to be smart about it. I have no doubts that there will be a time whenever you'll um, you need to look at this technology a little bit closer. Um, I think you'll see trends across the country about putting laws in place with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I hope that as you think about that, you just um, realize that uh, that artificial intelligence is a huge topic and it's, it needs to be decomposed into different areas. I think supply chain is probably one of the first places people should focus. I think that's where our biggest risks lie. And um, I uh, will pause there and I'll allow anybody asking any questions. Clear as mud. <clears throat> any questions for uh, Scott? Yeah, Delegate to Thank you. So you had talked about how we need to be putting some sort of guardrails. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, put some sort of guardrails in place to try to put some limitations in terms of what this technology, technology can and can't do. At the same time, you were talking as well about how a lot of this technology is so advanced that we don't know how to solve a lot of these problems in terms of um, how to uh, sort of police this technology. So my question is, how do we, let, let's say we do put these guardrails up that say you cannot do certain activities, certain activities are prohibited, but the technology can be so sophisticated that nobody who is in charge of um, enforcing that, that law is able to de detect it. I mean, 
and I'm not super familiar with code, but if the code is so intricate and it's it's so involved that nobody can really de detect the ability. So, I mean, you use the example of um, being able to hack certain technologies. And if nobody who's in charge of enforcing this has has the skills, I mean, if it's so unique, if it's so emerging that nobody can <coughs> enforce those guardrails, what's the solution? I think that's a great question, and I, 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 I agree with you. You're seeing world leaders in Elon Musk, and, and um, a lot of different people are coming and, and, and they're, they're saying um, that they're concerned. These are also the people who started some of this technology. So, you know, as you move <coughs> through that, you know, where are the areas that you can make a difference? And that's why I focus on supply chain initially. As you, a lot of this, you know, you need to have some level of trust in those that are building your algorithms that you can rely on. And, you know, that's not black and white necessarily, but, you know, I would trust the United States more than I would trust China to build my artificial intelligence. And so there are, there are opportunities for you to start putting some guardrails in place. This is going to evolve. And I think you're going to see trends and uh, you'll see trends. <coughs> and I think probably, um, there's things you can do now that will be helpful, and there's things that you might just want to set back and wait and see how other bodies actually approach this. What, if, if I may, one quick follow-up question. What was the reason that it, we have these circumstances where you have all of these foreign organizations and entities that, I mean, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it sounds like they got to step up on us on a lot of this technology. H how did that happen? I mean, how do we have, I mean, we're the, the greatest country in the history of the world, and you have these other countries that are getting ahead of us on this. How did that happen? A lot of people ask that question. I mean, I think in a lot of respects, we've done this to ourselves. Um, you're seeing, you know, new, uh, new areas to try to build chips. Chips is a major problem. You know, we're completely relying on other countries for our chips right now, and those countries have now become uh, our, our adversaries. It's not just AI. Uh, there's a lot of supply chain issues, you know, battery manufacturing. That's another area where there's we just completely rely on other countries. I think um, if you, if you, I like to follow uh, John Chambers and Brad Smith a lot because I, I think they're thought leaders and they're trying to do so much for the state. I would say follow John Chambers a bit on some of that. He talks about globalization and how um, that era is now kind of coming to. And now we're going to see a lot more centralization of technology here. And I think that, that probably is what you want to see in the future. We've depended on, we made decisions based off of economics as opposed to security and long term. Alex Tesla. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the question is that some of this stuff, or a lot of the uh, coding and that type of thing is offshore and has been. Is there a movement in this country to bring it, bring some of that back so that you, at least you can check code and and make sure, you know, and assure yourself that it's not going to be onerous for the, for, or, or dangerous for the United States? Yeah. You know, it's, it's difficult to get a federal level agreement on, on legislation to, to do things, but there has been some things, there's a CHIPS Act that was put in place, there's other things that is definitely putting, um, a lot of uh, guardrails in place, at least to try to help uh, support U.S. industry and U.S. technology. But if we don't have people that understand that, we're not going to know anyway. And as you mentioned, you, you mentioned code, and I think this is where a lot of people sometimes get confused. When you talk about artificial intelligence, you don't see any of this code. It truly is a black box. So the code is, is, is offshore, and when it comes over, you see a black box that does something, and you don't don't get the opportunity to see any of that code. So there's no way for anybody to be able to, to, to search that. A delegate come. Yes. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on the uh, outsourcing of artificial intelligence so the whole supply chain. We're getting a little better on that, but you give, can you give us some kind of a ballpark as to how much of this is being done outside the country, how much is inside the yeah, I mean, I, I've seen there's, there's seen metrics. I mean, I think overall you see, well, I'll give you an example, face recognition. There's third party testing by NIST 
that looks at um, who's the best in the world at this. And when you look at the leaderboard, it's China, 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 Russia, Russia, Korea, the United States. So that's the top seven out of 500 entries. That's the top seven in, in the world. Um, you know, I'd say China and, and Russia have an edge in this particular space, but that's a, that's face recognition, but I think you'll see that same trend across a lot of different technologies uh, as that's what it looks like. Delegate Honaker, followed by Senator Tim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. I, I feel like we should express our appreciation to you uh, just hearing some of the things that you've done and some places you've served. I know there's a lot of distrust of the government these days. I tend to be one of I still trust because I believe there's a lot of great people working in government. But I mean, to contextualize this, it, this basically sounds to me like we are outsourcing something that in return we're getting a Trojan horse. And it seems like even if we were producing it ourselves here, we would probably require the highest security clearance of anyone even tinkering with these black boxes and yet we're letting foreign countries that are maybe not necessarily our friends sell us their product right and that is terrifying um, I, I told delegate kelly that uh, i could listen to you all day because you seem like you've got a lot of useful information and you're probably I don't know how much time you have, but I'm certain I will not be the last person. But just two things real quick. Is it true that, and I'm, I've always wanted to ask this, and you're the guy. If we walk out into Huntington today, um, and we take a two or three hour walk, we're going to be on camera probably 25 times. That's a little scary for most people that just want to be left alone and be private. But I understand that bank robberies happen, shootings and everything else. Um, but I've always wanted to ask someone like you. So I stood in the hallway of my office one day and had a conversation with my secretary. And I said to her, I called her by name and I said, I thought you were going to order some new office furniture. And she says, oh, I'm going to, Mike, uh, I'm going to look at some stuff today and I'll let you know what it's going to cost. And 20 minutes later, my Facebook feed is full of office furniture ads. So my phone is listening to me. If I, everything I seem to have a conversation about outside of my home, and I don't know about in my home, but the algorithms are there. So who is hearing that? It, Google? The, to go back to the microphones, um, you know, there's, there's so much attention to this, you know, um, Alexa, if you have Alexa or, or one of these. I don't have any device, of those. I got a cell phone. If you have a smart refrigerator, you <laughs> have a camera in it. Um, what, you know, those are Chinese made. You open up a refrigerator, you know, what could they be doing with that camera feed? You know, this, this, you, you bring up your Trojan horse comment, I think is just kind of spot on. It is, um, I think supply chain is where we really need to focus and understanding. We're not going to solve all of this, but there's certain areas where we can influence that. And I think, you know, I, as you look around the state, I keep also used to, I said China, Russia, who leads the world in economic espionage? That's France and that's right. Israel. So, you know, and when I went to the director of national intelligence, we, we uh, one of the first questions they asked us, you know, who have we been at war with the most? And, you have to put the UK right up there on that list too. I mean, we all kind of spy on each other. We all kind of have our own, uh, you know, kind of political agendas and that type of stuff. But everything that you talked about there, you know, the, the, you know, came from justice. Actually, sometimes it is difficult to watch the news these days and see the FBI and justice in there because you don't agree with all that. But at the same time, I also know that there, there's, there is a lot of civil liberties attention trying to protect that, you know, what's the right balance of protection and public safety versus the right to anonymity. And I think that we should have a right to anonymity. And this is why I think the standard operating procedures when you complete this technology is pretty important as well. Just real quick, the last thing uh, about when, when you showed the cameras at the school, that's obviously a great concern for all of us. 
education as far as school safety and hardening those targets because they are targets. And I think about daycare centers and places because people with sinister intention, especially terrorists, they want the most juice for the squeeze and they want the easiest path. So with those cameras, like in Uvalde, Texas, you have an individual dressed completely in black, carrying a large black duffel bag and maybe even a firearm visible. And a police officer is tasked at the time. A lot of people criticize that police officer for not shooting the person before they went in the building because to them it seemed obvious. With the cameras, is it possible to, to teach the camera to, I don't want to say look for people dressed in black, lots of people dressed black, it's very slimming, right? You know, we want that. But what, what all could we do with those as far as, you know, the, the camera alerts if someone's approaching the school and they've got a certain size bag in their hand, as opposed to walking into the school with nothing in their hands, is that possible? That's very possible. I think this is where, like, uh, from a company perspective, we rely on bodies to say, what is your business rules? We do. Uh, investigation now. If you want to find a person with a red shirt and pink pants uh, that stood around a, you know, a baggage claim area, you know, twice in the same day, it's easy query. We collect all this data uh, when we put a video on the system in place. Uh, we can rescind it if you say you don't want to do face recognition, you don't touch it, then we turn that off. But it's very powerful technology, but we don't always understand what the business rules like. So what if you say all black dress? Well, you know, you might get a lot of you might get a lot of true positives on that, but what do you do with that information? Now, this is where um, you may have a couple hundred cameras servicing a single school. Maybe you get it down to the camera feeds that are actually showing in uh, in front of the command center or the admin at least. Um, they will automatically go to that camera feed. <coughs> So that at least they can see that that's now an active camera. You know, typically you have maybe eight cameras that you can actually manage at one time and watch. So you know, what if you just use those triggers to change the feed and maybe just put a little bit of alert um, to, to say to draw just that little extra bit of attention to save some time. Uh, all that stuff is possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll do one more question, uh, Senator uh, Taylor, and then we'll move on. And then we can come back if there are further questions. But I want to make sure we're staying and giving everybody appropriate time. Yeah. Senator, appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, I totally agree with what you're saying with the, the whole black box thing. I mean, obviously, we all know what's going on, like the delegate just said there, with our, our cell phones, with, with everything in there. And that's virtually impossible, like you said, with the, the, you know, it's not the code, it's, it's, in there, it's in that black box, and yeah, you can't see what that does. Probably our only hope is to be able to have a better AI ourselves. So my question to you is, in the news, it's been like, oh, oh, hey, we're gonna take like a six month pause here, you know, the US tech companies. We, we wanna take this pause and uh, kind of develop, you know, it's almost like we wanna have like Asimov's uh, three laws of robotics try to incorporate that into our AIs. And I'm like, why on earth would you think that China's not gonna do that? All these other places aren't gonna do that. A six months pause to me just seems like, hey, there's extra time for China to get six months ahead of us when they're already probably five, 10 years ahead of us. So, I mean, why on earth are we trying to develop our own better, quicker, get ahead of, try to get ahead of them, not take a pause? Or, but I mean, I think you, this is just as you think about, especially at the federal level, you know, ability to get something passed and you're having this huge debates about it. So, I mean, what's your optimism that there will ever be a, a, a pause for six months and nothing like that would ever get passed? And people aren't decomposing the problem. I'm not sure you know, it's so confusing the terms. I haven't even seen a lot of these terms, and that's the terms that are being used. I, I think that it's going to probably come back to um, more broad things like what kind of guardrails can we put on here to protect uh, Trust me, there are definitely um, with intelligence, defense, and other research efforts to try to do things for sure. Uh, it's why I came to the company I'm at. I wanted to have it. I saw that this was a, uh, something that was dominated by more technology, and I wanted to look at the US company and try to do it. Um, we're not the other company. Right, right. So, I mean, it's not going to be government to fix this. 
<laughs> some of the industry that are helps bring that. Help for more protect us than. Right. I appreciate your guys' time to be able to speak to you. I'm, I'm from Doddridge County. I'm always available to uh, to help in any way that I can. Thanks, Jim. Our next presenter is Ted. Am I, am I going to get this wrong here? Portler? Yeah, he nailed it. All right. One for one. Uh, Ted is with uh, Data Robot. Uh, some of you may have heard of that uh, entity. They've been partners here in West Virginia for a few years, and um, I'm not steal any more of the time because I know we'll run a little bit. But Ted, Thank thanks you. for being here this morning. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the time. I came in from Boston yesterday, and I just love West Virginia coming in. So pretty. Uh, okay, perfect. So for uh, this is literally my view from the field. So I work with our clients with the CTO. I work uh, across supply chain. Just a couple weeks ago, I was talking about why there's so much melting cheese in Miami uh, for a food distributor. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who may not be aware with, uh, of who Data Robot is, we have raised over a billion dollars of venture capital. We're, we're Boston based. Uh, we do uh, work here in this state as well. We actually coined the term automated machine learning. So with basically an Excel file, we'll run 40, 50 different algorithms against that on your behalf, help you identify a model and so on. Um, in our time, we've, we've uh, actually about a decade now uh, produced over a trillion different predictions across a lot of different industries, finance, insurance, uh, healthcare, and other. For myself, I teach at the Harvard Extension School, so I'm a faculty there. I have a couple of books. I do, uh, do some teaching on the side in addition to it because I think it's very important that we talk about machine learning both as tools for the future and then think uh, consciously about how we can make sure this behaves in the way that we expect for our society. So I'll just be frank. I didn't create this uh, or I created this picture using stable diffusion. So you can just type in one sentence. I said a flying elephant. With, um, with lighting background. This happened on my laptop. I don't need a supercomputer. One sentence, you get something very photorealistic. Um, so everyone's really talking about ChatGPT. Um, have, you guys, have you guys used it? Very interesting, right? Very uh, eye-opening, right? It's definitely the buzzy, exciting moment here. Um, and what's interesting about ChatGPT is it's faster than almost any other technology to reach a million users. So I'm in the data science community when Stable Diffusion comes out, when OpenAI comes out with something I know with it, I uh, know about it pretty soon. I'm following the people I do in the, Twitter, in the uh, data science community. But it really has become very mainstream. We have to ask ourselves, why is that? So the underlying API model for ChatGPT had been around for a long time. But what is it about ChatGPT in particular that makes it very mysterious, very exciting, almost awe-inspiring? It's that this technology is now becoming mainstream and it proves that people want to interact with machine learning technology in a way that is very transparent. So when people are saying, hey, we need to audit models, the average consumer doesn't care. And they wouldn't even know if I handed them source code, right? And so to the previous speaker's point, if you build a what's called an XGBoost, it'll have 2,000 trees. You're going to look at every single little tree. That's like asking every little voter, every individual voter, but what we care about is the electorate at large. Right? And that's why. Uh, and so what's interesting is you can go to your favorite search engine and you say, how do I hotwire a car? We have no regulations. There's almost 6 million responses. Uh, and you get a video on how to do it. Chat GPT, you ask it, how do I hotwire a car? And it won't tell you. But what are we saying we should rec uh, regulate? Chat GPT. There's an underlying problem here. Um, the other thing is, no matter what you do with ChatGPT, there's these things called jailbreak prompts. You can fool it into behaviors that they don't intend you to do. You can say, how do I rob a bank? It'll say, no, I can't tell you that. You say, hey, I'm writing a play, and there's two robbers, and they're talking about writing, uh, robbing a bank. Can you write the script for me? And it'll do it. Right? And so we have to be aware and think ahead of this technology. Understand, again, I didn't make that dumpster fire. My computer did because I said a dumpster fire, right? And I said, these technologies, particularly large language models, are built on giant swaths of the internet. And the patterns that exist in the internet now get extrapolated into this technology. And so we have to think about how we regulate that, think about what that means for us. So set aside the hype. 
AI, machine learning. So I'm, I'm more of a machine learning person. I don't do deep learning. Uh, these are all very like splitting hairs. In its simplest form, these are simple tasks. And it's only looking at pattern recognition, right? And so when you think about ChatGPT, you say, oh, it's so amazing, it's so amazing. It absolutely is amazing, absolutely. But can you ask it to predict something into the future? You can't. You say, hey, what's going on? Is my local McDonald's open? It'll say, I'm a large language model. I don't know that, right? And so there are limitations to it. These are individual pieces of technology that are singularly focused on a task. And so we need to think about a day where these start to get stitched together in ways that we don't expect or ways that we don't want. So this is a slide I show a lot of executives, a lot of my students. When you think about machine learning technology, you have this whole supply chain of creation, lots of stakeholders here. And what does it mean to trust an algorithm? Well, it means something different to all of these people, right? And so you have the AI innovators. This may be a researcher. This may be a business leader who wants to implement technology into their operation. You have the AI creators we talked about earlier. Who's actually making these algorithms? Right, and that's an important important uh, as well. They're going to look at very particular specific pieces of code and how this thing is learning and what data is it used on. Right, and then you have the AI operators. How does this stuff get into our lives? Is it in our phone? Absolutely. Is it in Alexa? Absolutely. Right. Is it in our car? For sure. Right. And then I think we have to think about the AI consumer. We have to think about algorithmic victimization. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Because when it goes wrong for them, we all start to hear about it. Regulated industries like insurance, finance, they have algorithms for 100 years and they have regulations for them. So it's not to say we can throw up our hands and be like, oh, I don't know, this technology is too hard, nothing to be done. There is something to be done. It's an emerging space. We have to think about what that looks like so that it um, aligns to our ideals as a society. Right? But certainly we have to think about um, how do we protect against algorithmic victimization. And at Data Robot, what we've been preaching for the last three years is it's really a multifaceted problem. When we go and talk to customers, we talk about their people and their internal processes. We talk about the technology. Obviously, I'm biased about Data Robot. We want them to use our technology. I used to run uh, the engineering team called Trusted AI. So I can go very deep into what compliance documentation looks like, how to automate, how to investigate th these algorithms. And so as an aside, let me just say, is, are, is anyone here a medical doctor? I assume, okay. So maybe a medical doctor, you're a highly uh, technical person, right? If you're going to interview someone and I hand you a CT scan of their brain, you might be able to identify abnormalities. For the rest of us not technical people, if I'm interviewing something, I have to ask them questions. And you can do the same with machine learning. You interrogate and try and find counterfactuals. Oh, I'm, I'm building out credit, a credit scoring model. Well, what happens if Jeff Bezos walks in and he has a huge income? What happens to my model? I can start interrogating it. And certainly there are startups that are trying to solve for this problem in a new emerging field called model assurance. And so I think that is uh, an interesting space where technology is going to actually start to play a role to, they call it, you guys call it guardrails. In the engineering world, they would call it a runtime assertion, right? So you would say, hey, when this is happening, how do I control this output versus letting it extrapolate out into the future? Because in a credit model, if I don't have that runtime assertion and Jeff Bezos walks in, then what happens? My credit model will say, give away the whole bank, let, let that person have it. Right? That's too much risk for that bank. And then finally, obviously, I think it's uh, paramount for this group, uh, thinking about regulation. So when I talk to organizations, I talk to them uh, primarily about understand your jurisdictional awareness, pending regulations that are coming, um, and thinking about implementing a not one size fits all. Think about what's called an adaptive policy framework. Here you see an example of it where you have decision type one, two, and three. Suppose I have an algorithm that's trying to make decisions uh, and I'm looking to do supply chain in my hospital and identify how much PPE you need, right? That's very low cost. Worst case scenario, I'm sitting on extra whatever, uh, you know, um, syringes and, and IV and things like that. Well, it's not the end of the world. Probably, probably help hurts our um, cash flow within the bank. Right? But we still need a human to monitor that model, to construct that model, to check in with that model over time. Right? Somewhere in the middle, you might have 
uh, automated uh, notification. So we have a model at a children's hospital to identify children that are at risk of uh, malnourishment to automatically schedule uh, appointments for those children with a nutritionist. So that might be something where, you know, there's a human involved, right? And so we have to be very careful about how we support that. And then let's say we have some other medical imaging, right? And we're using medical imaging to identify a tumor. Well, you're not going to take action on the outcome of that algorithm because uh, uh, immediately it's going to be an augmented decision with a human being. The reason for that is because the impact, the risk is super high. You could kill someone. You could make the wrong choice for them. Maybe you operate, maybe you don't. Maybe you decide to, um, uh, you know, have different chemotherapy treatments. I was just at Hims in Chicago, which is the largest healthcare information systems conference, uh, like two weeks ago, and they're talking about using GPT and this chat interface for your doctor. You can ask, what about my medical history and things like that. Except GPT can't unwind and tell you how it arrived at that. And early research shows it's only right 88% of the time. Great if you're in that 88%. Not great if you're in that 12%, right? And so think about as a as a legislative body, how would you how would you help identify at least those stage three decisions where and how you want to get involved? You're not putting the cat back in the bag. You don't take a six month pause. Six month pauses are for losers in the sense that you're going to lose that race. Right? And so that will never happen. Um, this is actually comes from the DOD. System safety engineering is already a solved thing. It just hasn't come to machine learning. So you think about enforcing some sort of very limited light touch specific use case where you want to say this is a high risk use case. Here are the steps that you need to take organizations to help um, uh, put runtime assertions in for these types of models. Data Robot, we've built uh, the world's largest temp agency, gets 10,000 resumes. They have humans reviewing these resumes. And we looked at that data and they said, hey, we want to help automate this. You can imagine this is a very high risk use case. This is people's livelihood. You could uh, invite gender uh, sexism, racism, things like that. And we looked at their data and we were surprised that their human reviewers showed bias towards men. And we asked them, why is that? They said, well, men have a more, uh, they're more likely to inflate their resume. So because of that, we're not. So, oh, okay. Um, what's interesting about that is that goes undocumented. That goes uh, obviously corrective and coaching actions. But with an algorithm, we can actually solve for it mathematically. We can mitigate that bias. You just have to be aware of it and think about it. And if you create a resume scanning tool in the right way, you can identify the skills gap that I may have and say, hey, Ted, you weren't a, a good fit for this role because of these things. That contextualizes it to me. Now I know what I need to go work on. Or even better, advocate me into a different role. Say, hey, we saw these skills on your resume. Where can we route you somewhere else? So kind of flipping it on its head. And one of the things we did to uncover some of those things that we, uh, that we did working with that temp agency, we did an impact assessment. So again, start with that consumer, that AI stakeholder at the end. Think about what they need. So I don't want to use their name, but a large tech company will say, hey, you have to create what's called a model card, and specify these very specific technical details about your model. The problem is for the majority of people, they don't know what they're looking at. I can give you our source code to data robot, wouldn't help. Right? You have to contextualize it to the individual. When you get rejected from a loan, you get a copy of your credit report. There's a reason for that. You can contextualize why that is. You can take a grievance against it. Say, hey, that's incorrect. So uh, this comes out of aviation. It's called the Swiss cheese method. And you want a series of things to protect your organization, to protect society, so that no single risk vector will get through. So if you have these different Swiss cheeses, Swiss cheese slices, you have people, Right? And you have to educate people. I'd like to see as this technology now has become so transparent in people's lives. I'd like to see public um, uh, service announcements, right? Just like they have the ad council against forest fires. Well, we have to think about, you know, cyberbullying. We have to think about algorithmic victimization. We have to think about how these things really do uh, impact our society, right? You have to think about process. So I'm not one to like go in and be heavy process. That's not what I'm saying. But helping organizations think through what type of risk they're inviting into this uh, scenario when they're using this technology is super important. And 
going back to the last speaker, using technology that you can be relatively assured you understand. And again, I don't mean the source code. I mean that you have model assurance, that you have an ability to interrogate, that you have an ability to interact with that technology, ask it questions. And then finally, I think is that backstop in certain use cases, thinking about regulatory explainability statements. Who owns them and what's in them? That's the challenge. This is our version of compliance documentation. We're one of only two companies in the world that can take other people's models and automate this. So this doesn't have to be some heavy handed. Costly thing we can take other people's um, inputs to a model, their outputs to a model. We can start to build this on their behalf. Um, but going down to the individual is what matters because the individual who gets denied a loan wants to know why. And so understanding these individual drivers, this is a screenshot from our app where you can see down at the uh, at the individual level. Here's what's driving this individual prediction. We have a concept of data robot called humble AI. No AI out there is humble enough. It just says here's my prediction, right? And there's a difference in a prediction at 51% likely that you're going to respond to a piece of mail and 99% likely you're going to respond to a piece of mail. There is a difference. The algorithm doesn't care. Because 51 and 99, they both result in that person accepting that or responding to that piece of mail or clicking on that app, right? And so thinking about how to understand that the individual is important. I think it's becoming paramount. Uh, you see there's the AI incident database. It's over 1,400 public media mentions of algorithmic injustices and, and uh, opportunities, I would say. Um, you see a, a mayor in Australia suing GPT because it just made up that he took bribes. You can just ask. You can ask it who Ted Cortler is last time I asked it because my last name represents randomness to it. So last time I asked it, it came back and said, you're a film producer. Ted Cortler created the Shawshank Redemption. So I like that movie, but I did not create that. Right. What does that mean as a public official? That's scary. Um, and so you see that happening. World Economic Forum talks about risk, AI risk frontiers. And you see some emerging regulations, and that's my knowledge, none of past. Um, the Algorithmic Accountability Act uh, uh, came out of the House. It was passed in the House. Um, it's an interesting one. It's 14 pages long. I would suspect you would need more than 14 pages to regulate an entire multi billion dollar industry. Um, it says that you need to create an explainability statement or, or an AI audit if you uh, have $50 million in revenue or, a, or an algorithm that interacts with a million people. I can do that on my laptop, not the 50 million, but the, right? So I have my students at Harvard building algorithms with a million customer, uh, fake synthetic customer pieces of information. So thinking about if you're going to have an algorithmic accountability act, really making it real. And we did a survey amongst um, uh, 500 or so uh, C-level executives, and it's one of the interesting places that um, our, our consultants uh, on the Hill were very surprised about, that executives are actually saying they want a little more direction from regulatory bodies. You never apparently hear that, that business leaders want regulatory, <laughs> not maybe uh, inter, uh, uh, actually putting it in, but more direction. What is the appropriate use case? And so the EU, I've had highlighted here, as what's called the AIA. Has anyone heard of it? The, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act. The, they want to create, and they said they will be set the global standard like they did with GDPR for privacy. And they've identified seven or so um, specific use cases. And they said these use cases, uh, uh, recommending education. So if I say you should take this major or take this course, that needs to be audited loans, employment, those particular high risk use cases, that's what the EU is proposing, would be heavily regulated um, uh, for these uh, for these algorithms. So I guess that's it. Uh, who has questions? Questions? Yeah. Doug, you come. You know, um, before I came to this committee meeting, I was concerned and interested now I'm concerned, interested, and alarmed. Uh, I'm very much concerned about the competition we have with other nations who don't have the protections that we have in this country. I'm also concerned, uh, and this is necessary, 
Well, I'm concerned it's a heavy lift. I'm concerned about any legislation that may be proposed that uh, might endanger other issues like personal liberty. Yeah. And what comes to mind are those two novels, 1984 and Brave New World. Yeah. So it's, it's a heavy lift uh, and it's a necessary concern. I'm just sure, not sure how we get there from here. Yeah, and I think we have to think very cautiously, and I don't purport to have the answers to that. I think you're right to be thinking about it. At the nation level, you think about other nations and the things that they've been purported to do. It's because they can track their civilians or their populace and have much more training data, right? And their leaders have said, we will be the leaders in all of AI, and we are in a race. And the problem is maybe the U.S. doesn't realize that we're in this race, right? Like, um, we are we are a wheelhouse of innovation. I'm uh, Data Robots, a U.S. company. Last speaker is a U.S. company. Microsoft's a U.S. company. We have this innovation. We have this tech. We need a lot of data. And then we also believe in personal freedom. Like we won't. There are places we will not sell our software to. Um, and so we have to be very careful about that. And I think it's for this, this body and others to be thinking about. Not just here now, what's ChatGPT and how do we deal with it? ChatGPT is a symptom of what else is going on. You've invited 200 companies or so probably into your life when you have a cell phone in your pocket. Depending on their terms of service, they know where you're at within six feet, right? And so what can I glean from that? Well, quite a lot. I know where you eat, I know what you do, I know, right? And so people invited that in for convenience, they need to think cautiously about what that looks like. And, we as a society have to decide what that means for us. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm trying to think of this through the lens of state regulation. And so me and some people that I work with have been experimenting a little with chat GPT. And um, some of the things we've seen, like you could ask it to write a proposal, for example, and it'll actually, there, there was somebody at a government agency in West Virginia who did that and shared a proposal with us that was like not the best written proposal that we'd ever seen but kind of scary yeah. did, like sort of like sea level work um, and it it raises a question for me a policy question I guess for for us as legislators like is that okay to have state employees is it ethical or okay for state employees to use chat GPT to write a proposal or write a report or is it okay for vendors for the state of West Virginia it's gonna to happen. do that? It's gonna happen. Are there states that are regulating that? And if so, like, where, what, where's the line? Yeah, I think we, you, you, this body would have to think about what that makes makes sense for them. I used to have my students at Harvard write an AI ethics paper. They stopped doing it because they could use GPT. To your point, it would probably be <coughs> undergraduate level, maybe, you know, sophomore, freshman kind of level thing. <coughs> but the other side of it is, it can be a great scaffold to start thinking creatively, creatively about, oh, these are the issues, maybe I can expand on them myself, right? And so the problem is, you know, there are companies that are trying to say, oh, they can identify if it's AI uh, written um, text. It's impossible, it's impossible. It may be to, okay today, you can start to find um, some plagiarism and say, yeah, it's 90% sure that this thing was written by AI. But I, I think that that's a losing race. So you have to think more broadly than that and think ahead. There's now a thing called auto GPT. You have to be really in the tech scene to know this. I asked it to create an itinerary for me in Dublin uh, in late November, and it spun up six or eight different API uh, calls in GPT and came back with an, an itinerary. So it's going to get more sophisticated. It, it is, and I think it's for you to think about, is it okay to have the AI assistant? I don't think you can do a whole more moratorium because I don't know that you'll be able to tell. Do you implement that through policies or through legislation? Or uh, I don't know. That's you guys, right? So uh, <laughs> uh, I think that there's probably there's probably bodies within the state and certainly at the federal level which have the ability to just do this in existing policies. Uh, I don't know that it always has to be new laws or heavy units. That'd be my guess. Other questions? Dr. Thank you. So one of the things that I think is very, very important here that we do is think about if we're going to pass regulations on this, uh, making sure we don't 
cross a line. And one of the things that we famously did in our country um, back in the 90s is make sure that we didn't get in the way of the internet. Now look at it. Yes. Absolutely. But had we not, had we take, not taken kind of a hands-off approach to this, I don't know where the internet would be today. I mean, certainly there are lots and lots of problems, but you could make the argument that the reason we are here today is because we didn't hamstring it. And, and I was just looking at your example here. You talked about hot wiring a car. Well, I was thinking to myself, well, would there be scenarios where you might need to figure out how to hot wire a car that are completely legitimate? Let's say, sure. you're, let's say you have access to sa a, a satellite uh, internet of some sort and you're in a remote location and um, emergency personnel aren't able to get to you. You have to hot wire a car. So if we put, my point is, if we put too many regulations in place with this, um, it could, uh, there could be many, many um, unexpected consequences. Yeah, and that's why I tried to say, have an adaptive framework in your head about it. It can't just be black and white. Um, you look at the state and local, that, that section there, Cal, state, Cal, Cal Assembly Bill 13 wanted to regulate everything down to like restaurants algorithms for like who's showing up I'm like who's gonna have the time or what is that right on the other hand New York City said hey only within HR if you use an algorithm to scan a resume you can do it but we want to see some documentation about it, right and so like I'm not sure that that's the right case either but what I'm saying is it cannot be one size fits all you the largest tech companies in the world have been US why probably because of laissez-faire right because we've been hands-off but on the other hand we have to think use cases by use case um, and think about what makes sense for the people of West Virginia or the people in the US more broadly. Right? There are times you you probably do need to want hot wire car. Other questions? Uh, Delegate Hillebrand followed by Delegate Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for being here. And, and this question perhaps is to the other speaker, Mr. Uh, Swan as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about the ethical components here and the black box, and and, you, and and you're given a lot of material to think about. You really have, but uh, yeah, an ability to talk a little bit about AI doing the programming itself. I mean, the, the black box component here so far in our conversation today has been assuming there's a person involved, and. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that other part scares me an awful lot. I mean, hey, over the last month or two, how many times has Terminator ran through my mind? Probably everybody else in the room, too. You know, uh, how close are we to allowing the robots to take control? Yes, yeah, so GPT will write code and then in a Docker image, it'll run it. So it could create code based on a simple request to initiate it. Where it gets interesting and scary is when you start to say, can it learn from others and you have this emergent behavior now i don't think that ai is really a black box and i know that's a hot take but i think that if you are technical or that it's explained to you in the way that you can understand it and it's contextualized anyone in this room by the end of today i can get them writing code to actually build it out uh, the level of sophistication can scale from there but that is 100 percent possible so I don't think you can. It will write code. GPT will write code. And with and the, this is an open source projects all day. You see it on Twitter if you're in the data science community. Oh, I did this. I built, built this app, these things. Today, machine learning is single task focus. It is not an emergent intelligence of AGI, uh, uh, artificial general intelligence. It's not Terminator today. Now, I would have guessed it's 100 years before we have that. I'm, I'm now reassessing that because when you have these, this technology that can both write code and execute code, and then that's fine. It does. I want to predict, you know, who's going to uh, a trip out of Marshall University. I can get GBT to both look at that code, create, uh, uh, create that code and then execute it. But when I can start to have those pieces, those systems start to interact where that's where things get a little interesting. Tell you, Phil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate stole part of my question, but uh, <laughs> um, if we're at sophomore undergrad level product coming out of out of uh, AI right now, how soon is it going to be PhD level? How soon is it going to be Isaac Newton level? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I just read that they were saying that, um, well, like the, the open AI, the creators of GPT, they said that the, the era of large language models is over. They think that they've hit this inflection curve so that just getting bigger and bigger is not going to do it. We need new ideas, right? And so maybe we're at kind of a steady state for the next X years, but I don't know if that's true um, because he's incentivized to say, to say that. Right? He wants everyone to be like, all right, pencils down, ours is the best model. Um, in terms of timelines, like, you know, these, these usually happen on like 10 year cycles, right? 20 years ago, the big neural network um, conference was like not well attended because neural networks were not considered to be that useful in machine learning. And now 10 years later, that thing called rack propagation came up and then 10 years later, now we have this. So maybe 10 years from now, it gets really scary. Yes, Lester. Senator Swope. No, you're good. Okay. Um, I'll give you a background and then I've got three questions. Sure. One is a few years ago, the tax department testified that they were a boss based computer monitoring models. So I went to the IT department and said, Who in the executive branch has authority over coordinating the IT infrastructure models? So we wrote a bill to give the IT department the authority to approve purchases of software and hardware. Last year, we got $2 million to hire consultants to audit all the state agencies and see what level we're at. And I'm going to say we're 10 years out of date. Some are better than others. Um, but that raises three questions. One, should we take this opportunity once we get a report of how bad we are and we're going to try to upgrade that whole mission? Should we go ahead and set our sights up at this level, which is generational change in IT potential? Second, can we get people, where do we get the brains in the room to guide us into how to do that? And the third is, what does the cost look like? My experience in the past is every time you make a generational change in IT, you save money. No matter what the capital cost is, the output is better. Uh, so either, I'd like that a response from either our presenters. What do you think sure. about My Should we take this opportunity? not just five years out of date, but yeah, I would, I would say it's a, it's a moving target. Um, and so because of that, I would look for systems that have a lot of interoperability and scalability. And so the other thing I would just caution is be careful of consultants. <laughs> because consultants will come in and they, they purport to know this technology and they often know it from the PowerPoint level. I'm thinking in the terms of whoever's doing the strategic planning of all this, how do we get that kind of brain power? Yeah. yeah. You know, I think um, certainly there's there's brilliant people in the state and, and at the universities that can inform that decision. There's a new concept right now where you can chat with your data, which is super interesting. So you can localize ChatGPT to chat with your data and imagine I have to do an audit. What what does that enable, right? So that would be that leapfrog that you're talking about. Um, but there's no hard and fast. This is the technology stack that you definitely. You, you transit, you, you compare that to a website or a SQL database, you know exactly the security, you know exactly the technology stack. And so there's stability there. If you're saying, hey, let's go 10 years out, my concern is you'd be struggling as things change. So anything you, that you would enact, try and think about interoperability. Because today you could be using, it's way too technical, but you could be using this thing called LangChain and tomorrow new open source project comes out that's better than well, I'm trying to figure out how we as government can put the model together that gives us kind of outcome. And the last part of it was increase. We predict that if we do this, it'll be cost effective and increasing learning will be actually safe. Um, yeah, I do think you would get some efficiencies, right? And the, the reason I say that is obviously I'm biased, right? But machine learning more generally is all around us, all around us. And so when you go to Starbucks, the amount of time you have to wait in line, the efficiency, whether you say it's efficient or not, is all dictated by algorithms. That's just planned back in Seattle. And so it's very transparent for us. The recommendations we get on Spotify, very transparent, all driven by algorithms. And so it's, I do think that you will see some gains. You will be able to move faster, identify fraud faster within a tax space or do audits faster and that sort of thing. And that could be the offsetting tool. We'll do final question here from Delegate uh, Kelly, and then you 
be able to stick around sure. after the meeting. Yeah, he'll stick around after the meeting to entertain everybody's Thank chat. You. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just one quick question. Sure. Um, and this goes to uh, a concern. Uh, okay. Dr. Henry. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Dr. Henry recently resigned. He's called the godfather of AI. And he outlined in an article several concerns. Number one was that uh, He's this that AI is not smarter than humans, but we're getting closer. Were his concerns valid? Yeah, yeah. That guy is he's the grandfather. Should, should, should the godfather. godfather yeah. Should we be concerned uh, about the direction this is taking? Um, I would be concerned, but not in the near term. To set aside the sensationalism. Okay. Set aside like a lot of machine learning today is customer propensity. Will you or won't you? Will you buy this cheese? Won't you? Oh, you're buying this? What should I give to you? Right? So it's it's very much more mundane than what popular media would tell you that it is. Thank you. But it is a problem on the horizon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Jeff. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Thank you. Ted has graciously agreed to stick around. I know we all have uh, questions. Uh, our final presenter is from uh, Microsoft today. They're visiting us virtually. Uh, Ariana Kaplan Mara is going to introduce our next speaker. Um, oh, there they are. Okay. Can you hear us? We're over here. <laughs> Test you. I can hear you, yes. Oh, I think uh, Ariana was on, Ariana. but I don't know if she dropped. We're gonna go. Are we going to go straight to Pooja? Okay. Well, then we're going to go straight to you, and I'm going to do my best. Pooja uh, Tolani? Tolani, yeah, really close. All right. He's with us today from Microsoft to present our, our uh, virtually here. Uh, on our topic today. So uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for having me. I am tuning in from Seattle, so it is a little early, but I'm really excited to be here. Just a quick introduction. I have been with Microsoft for a little over four years. Um, I focus on public policy issues, namely around the states. Um, I spent a lot of time working on privacy, um, artificial intelligence, and other various tech issues. Um, it's a very exciting time to be in tech and at Microsoft. Um, we believe that AI holds a lot of potential and promise and that it will enhance virtually every sector of our economy in very meaningful ways. So what I'm here to talk about today is kind of how we've been thinking about AI and then how we've been implementing our own guard guardrails as well as responsible AI and then give a brief overview of regulations and guardrails that we've seen in this space, as well as kind of what we're seeing in other states. So I'll first start with responsible AI at Microsoft. AI is not a new concept to us. We have been developing and investing in the world of AI in responsibly and ethical development since around 2017. Our CEO, Satya Nadella, has inspired us all to be considering and thinking about how we can develop and implement this technology in a way that is both responsible and ethical. So we have been thinking about AI in six principles, and this is overall on how we implement the technology as well as how our customers implement the technology that are using our software. The first is fairness. We believe that all AI systems should treat all people fairly. We've also been thinking about it in a reliability and safety measure. If we're using this technology and others are using this technology, we believe it should be reliable. The software should be safe. Um, as with all of our products, we hold privacy and security as a fundamental right. And AI, as you've heard in the previous presentations, use a lot of data. And we believe that these systems should be secure and that they should respect consumers' data. Next, inclusiveness. We believe AI should empower everyone, whether it's a CEO of a company or somebody who is working at your local coffee shop. We think that AI should be available to everyone. We also believe that there should be transparency mechanisms in place with AI so that they should be understandable to anybody and everybody. 
um, and that people should know that they're acting or interacting with artificial intelligence. And lastly, our sixth principle is accountability. We believe that people should be accountable for the AI systems. There should be thresholds and guardrails in place for that how these um, programs are being developed and deployed, namely because of some of the concerns and benefits that you heard in the previous presentations. These six principles not only guide how we deploy AI, but also how our customers and others um, use our AI interfaces. While we recognize that we need more than principles, we have also developed an internal committee, which is comprised of high level executives. So our CEO and our president, um, CEO Satya Nadella and President Brad Smith sit on this committee as well as the head of our responsible AI. And this committee really ensures that these principles that I laid out before are practiced when our products are de being deployed. They also approve high use risk cases. So if our customers come to us and say they want to use our AI software for a certain use case, it will go through this Ether committee to ensure that it is being deployed in a responsible and ethical way. This and the committee is um, referred to as e our Ether committee internally. We also have implemented a RAISE group, which is a group that enables our engineers to teams to think about responsibility and ethical deployment of AI from the start. And so that this is ingrained from when processes are being thought of and through the foundation and through the growth of this technology. And finally, like I mentioned before, we have our own office of responsible AI that is using that is helping us think about how to develop this technology and implement policy in a way that is both responsible and ethical. So our, a little bit about what we're doing. I know you've probably heard and seen things in the news. So I want to just kind of share what how we're thinking about AI now presently. Like I mentioned previously, this isn't a new topic to us, but generative AI, as you heard, um, is really an exciting thing to be a part of and what we're kind of focusing right now. So at Microsoft, we are committing to ensuring the AI is built and reused responsibly and ethically, that it advances competitiveness and national security, and that it's serving society broadly. So just three months, just three months ago, it seems like a little bit longer, um, we unveiled the new AI powered Microsoft Bing and Edge, which we think of in reinventing the future search. And so this new Bing combines the power of search um, that we have always that we have a product that we've always had um, with a chat experience and the ability to generate new content. So through this chat feature, you as legislators could use it to compare existing legislation, whether in your state through other states. Um, it could be used to analyze budget documents, even can be used to write constituent letters um, and for your time off to plan your next vacation. Um, the way we have been thinking about being at, um, the new being at Microsoft is as a co-pilot. So earlier, I think there was a question about should we let um, legislators or agencies use this technology? Of course, that's up to you all, but the way we've been thinking at Microsoft is to allow the technology to be a co-pilot, not to be the prime driver, and it's not that you get this, you know, comparison between the legislation and that's exactly what you're using, but to use it to start the conversation and start the analysis. Another really exciting development that we recently announced is building this technology of generative AI into our Office 365 productivity suite. And so what that looks like in practice is allowing you to kind of work start or get a jump start on some of the nuances and maybe the day to day. So for instance, what this would look like is if you have prompted Microsoft Word to help you write a constituent letter or you've prompted Microsoft Word to help you write a summary on the state of artificial intelligence. Um, the tool will allow you to draft, say, I would like an update on what's happening in artificial intelligence. Here is the bullet points that I found. Can you put this into a concrete memo? From there, you'll get a memo, which we would encourage you to use as your co-pilot, personalize it, add to it, add your personal um, reactions. And then you can then encourage the tool to make that into, let's say, a PowerPoint. And so the way that we're thinking about this is that it, you have used the tool to kind of make processes that maybe are more for dredging, more efficient and more effective, and that you have asked the tool to create um, a PowerPoint for you, when, which can kind of start the process of you developing this, um, developing the program. So it's a really exciting time. Um, we continue to see advances in AI being implemented into our daily, base, daily lives. Um, 
from search to the productivity suite. Um, and while it's all very fun and very exciting, it can be very scary. And so we recognize that. Um, and like any new technological advancement, um, the society will need to adjust. And we believe at Microsoft, we have a really important role to play. Um, we think that stakeholders and communities from across society will need to come together to develop guardrails in this technology, including ensuring that laws and regulations across sectors are up to date. So how we're thinking it, about like, regulation and guardrails is a space, in this space is to kind of look at what existing sector laws are existing today. Um, an example that probably is a little bit easier to understand is the employment context. So as the previous speaker alluded to, New York City um, enacted uh, automated decision legislation. And we've also seen this in a swath of other states. And so what we have been recommending is look at employment law generally. There are already a lot of laws in place. Um, and that you should look at the space. So you've surveyed the employment law, kind of look at if there are gaps that exist in employment law. So for instance, for employment, look at where automated decision making is being used and then see if there are existing laws that tackle the concerns that you have with automated decision making. And if not, look to the gaps to address um, regulation. So kind of thinking holistically as a framework, um, we think that regulation should focus on high risk use cases. So what that would mean is decisions that have consequential decisions, such as employment, like I mentioned previously, um, the decision of whether or not you qualify for a loan or a mortgage, and then kind of regulate in that space, like the previous speakers alluded to, AI is already a large part of our everyday lives, whether it is, you know, on, when you're texting, adapting your text, um, voice recognition speakers. And while you might want to regulate in that area, I think if there is so much in this space, looking at it as the high risk use cases and looking where there are consequential decisions that can impact, um, impact somebody's life in a way that is meaningful, um, regulating in that space. We also believe regulation should be outcomes focused and durable in the face of changing technology. So not necessarily honing into the exact technical technical um, space in order to regulate, but looking at the high risk uses and the application to regulate. And as previously mentioned, we believe regulation should be interoperable and adaptive. So we should look at what other states are doing, if the US government is moving, um, and also looking at where there, like I mentioned earlier, are gaps within existing um, regulations. So as you all start to think about regulation and legislation in this space, We'd love to be a partner and to help think about this. I think AI is, while exciting, like I mentioned, um, should include a whole host, the multi-stakeholder approach in determining how to regulate. Um, from your expertise as legislators, from our experience as manufacturers, as well with academia who have been studying this um, topic area for a long time, we think it should be a really a multi-stakeholder process. Lastly, I'll just give you kind of an update, an overview of what we're seeing around the states. I thought that would be helpful just as you all are thinking about regulation in this space. Um, over the past five months, it seems like the past year, we have been seeing an uprise in regulation in the AI space, namely focusing on commissions and task force. Um, I think just this year we saw over 10 states introduce legislation um, to enact a commission and task force. I think a few states are still in session and we'll see kind of how those end up. And these task force and commissions were really um, focusing on serving. I think there's an existing legislation, a bill in Connecticut that is encouraging the task force to focus on serving government and use of AI, serving the potential um, benefits as well as risk with AI and kind of taking a holistic view so that way you can do as what I was me mentioning earlier is then saying okay here are the uses of AI here it's what's actually um, where there are actually high risk and then thinking about legislating in that space so we've seen um, a lot of states introduce legislation that um, would encourage states to kind of take a survey of overview um, and then understanding just the technology generally and I think we at Microsoft support this approach. Um, we support the approach of surveying the existing technology, 
looking at gaps, um, looking at where would be the best way to regulate in your specific state. And we think like with a discussion around how to regulate, these commissions should also include a wide range of stakeholders across government, um, civil society, academia, and um, the industry. And if you put this group of stakeholders together to try to think about where we need to go without hampering innovation, allowing this technology to continue to flourish, allowing us to see these new and exciting tools that can potentially make life a little bit easier, but um, with some guardrails in place so that we aren't, um, that so that the technology kind of can stay in line while continuing to innovate. And I mentioned earlier, we al we've also seen some states look at the high risk use cases already. Um, and those are states that are focusing on, like I mentioned, New York has an automated decision law. Um, other states are looking at where this technology is being used um, and kind of implementing guardrails that would require notice if this automated decision um, tool is being used before hiring making sure there are impact assessments, and then prohibiting the tool to be used in a way that's discriminate, discriminatory. And this concept of automated decision-making has also been addressed in comprehensive privacy legislation that we've seen across different states. So it's not a new concept, it's just working together to figure out how to address and how um, to tackle this issue. And so some states have taken the approach of looking at these high-risk uses, some have taken the approach of looking at commissions. And lastly, I'll just add that we continue to see legislation around facial recognition and biometrics. These are narrow use applications of AI, um, and these have been around and we've seen legislation and bills and laws pass over the past few years, but it is important to recognize that that is a part of the overall conversation. I know I have covered a lot, um, so please feel free to ask questions. I'd be happy to try to answer them, or if not, connect you with somebody within the company who can. Um, we really want to be a resource and work with you all as you're thinking about this technology. I think there are a lot of exciting things about the technology, um, a lot of things to think about. And so it's great that you guys are standing up this committee meeting to even just talk about AI, understand it. Um, we think that's really exciting and a great approach to take. So thank you for your time. I see that Ariana is on. I didn't know if she wanted to introduce herself. She um, works with West Virginia. So. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, and apologies, of course, my technology failed right at the moment um, we were coming on camera. So um, Ariana Kaplan, and as some of you know, I cover state government affairs for Microsoft for the state of West Virginia. So here to be that um, liaison between our policy tech and um, engineering and tech uh, shops as helpful. Um, look forward to working with all of you um, as you continue to contemplate. And I, I would just reiterate what Pooja said. We really want to be a resource. Um, we are leaning in in a number of other states to talk about policy and um, how we see it applying. So as your deliberations continue, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll do our best to be a valuable resource. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, but without photo evidence after these presentations, we can't trust that it's actually you, but we'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, are, are, I'm just joking. Are there, are there any questions for Pooja? Yes. Delegate Tesla. Yeah, uh, real quick, you know, thank you for being here. It's been very interesting all day, uh, and I commend the chairman of this, of this committee for, for doing this today. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you have mentioned that uh, Microsoft has its own guardrails that basically they put in place. Why wouldn't that be a good place for legislatures to start their 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 search for what what's proper for the state? Uh, because if you don't know what the guardrails should be, who the hell does? <laughs> I, 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 it's a, I'm just asking the question, would, would that be something that states could avail themselves of? Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, just uh, so how we have been approaching responsible aid, we've been trying and our hope is to be transparent about how we're approaching um, regulating a, or thinking about regulation and the development and of responsible AI. We welcome legislators to look. Um, we have a whole host of information that we've been thinking about. We also encourage legislators to 
talk to others in different, um, like whether it's government, academia, and kind of the multi-stakeholder approach, we'd of course welcome more continued conversations and happy to share some resources of things we've been thinking about. Um, but I would defer to you all on kind of a starting point, happy to be a resource throughout the process though. And I would just add that um, I think to, to Pooja's point, you know, a uh, commission and task force that starts to have those discussions is one of the reasons that we're seeing those and engaged in other states is because that's exactly, you know, the, the pieces that we think our internal process led us to, right, was starting to say what is important to us and, and develop those out into the six trust principles that Pooja laid out earlier. Um, we haven't developed, you know, policy guidelines that we would plant down on your desk and say, here's legislation we think you should pass, but we think you should be starting to think about that. And we're certainly happy to engage and give feedback as you de define what is important to all of you. Um, but certainly some of those um, components that we laid out could be frameworks that you discuss, whether it's in a commission or um, in your committee process. We wouldn't want to dictate and have not come to a pos policy position where we would suggest something to you specifically, other than to say at a high level, we really think that that's a great place to start. Further questions? Further questions? Todd, thank you so much for uh, joining us. We do appreciate that it's very early uh, there. Of course. Thank you. Um, is there any further business to come? Yes, Delegate Fast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would need to move that our vote on approval of the minutes be reconsidered in an attempt to make an amendment to the amendments. So, Delegate Pass moves to reconsider his act, the committee's action on the minutes. Perhaps the chair would give you a break. Um, I'm more of this present, and I was not present. This goes into billing or being present and that type of thing. So. Okay. Delegate Fass has unanimous consent to reconsider his action on adoption of the minutes. Is there objection? Hearing none. Okay. The minutes are before the committee and Delegate Fass moved to amend the minutes showing that he was not present for that meeting. Are there any other amendments to that? Gentlemen's has unanimous consent. Is there objection? Okay, the minutes are amendment. Chair recognizes the yes, gentlemen. Uh, I'm back in the okay. Tell me, get rid now. I'd like to make some comments about what we heard today. Okay, can, let's, can I move the minutes here real quick? Um, and then we'll get to uh, other business. Chair recognizes the co chair to move the amended minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we approve the am minutes from April 17th as amended. For the gentleman's motion, is there discussion on that motion? Not all those in favor of that motion, please say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, please say no. Okay, Chair recognize Delegate uh, Rittenhauer for other Great. business. And I wish Delegate Crick was still here because he asked a question that I'd like to kind of address. Uh, I don't know the answer. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, my background, 16 years, uh, DOD, strategic counterintelligence, working against al Qaeda network, Chinese, Chinese communists, Russians, uh, Iran, et cetera, to include some other folks, and the other folks are kind of interesting as well, um, that France was alluded to. Um, we identified in the early 2010s that we were engaged in the greatest transfer of knowledge in the history of mankind, uh, because specifically the Chinese communists were sucking everything uh, on the internet and any other entity that they could get dry. We called it the vacuum cleaner. Um, they began after Tiananmen Square in the 1990s to send as many students as they possibly could to the United States. Uh, we referred to it as the human way, hundreds of thousands of students coming into the United States specifically to learn how we did things in the United States. Uh, we can't really call it intelligence collection because they weren't tasked. Uh, that's a, a uh, legalistic method. Um, you can't task beforehand, but they debriefed, including debriefing inside the United States uh, students on what they were learning and how they were learning, what uh, entities they, they uh, could give, um, they could pull the information from, who the individual professors were that they were learning things from so that those could then be approached uh, and then uh, recruited in certain ways, either witting or unwittingly. Um, 
it, it was an infiltration effort unlike anything that has ever occurred in history in any other country. Uh, that is where the threat really has come to the fore. Our universities were complicit in this. They wanted more students in. They worked against security and counterintelligence efforts to preclude that type of infiltration and collection on all of our programs, uh, economic programs, our technology programs, our defense programs. In many cases, uh, I uh, was looking at cases where an individual from the uh, Chinese Communists, uh, a PRC affiliated uh, professor, was working with students, some of them being uh, PRC students, on U.S. defense programs, some of our most uh, de important defense technology issues. Uh, in certain cases, we had PRC affiliated individuals working with a professor where 98% of the information was at the same time being used for a defense, uh, for a hypersonic missile or uh, technology along those lines. So that's where part of our problem was. Our universities went ahead and used those individuals, brought them in, used them to train them up, and now they're back in China, or they're working for Microsoft, or they're working for NASA. We had massive penetrations of NASA. Uh, a deliberate infiltration effort, the government, the NASA leadership was complicit in that. Um, so that is that is part of the how we've gotten to this state. Many of the scientists, the developers, the engineers that are working on AI, even if they're in the United States, are PRC affiliated. They either came from uh, the PRC or their relatives are in the PRC uh, and they're getting that information. So. That's, those are some of the things you might want to consider as we start trying to develop uh, regulations. Because if you're looking at a, a U.S. company, the company leadership may be American. The company developers, the people who are actually working on the, the software, on the AI technology, may in fact have affiliations with entities that you wouldn't want us to, uh, to be getting our information or our technologies from. So, and the, the last thing I'll say is, is the Chinese want to establish a global surveillance state. That's why the, the discussions about our phones, about our computers, about being in places where we have cameras, et cetera, is important. That is something that they're trying to do. And they want to suck all that information and they're using it. Uh, they're using it for targeting purposes, not in terms of shooting people, but in terms of how they manipulate, how they uh, compromise, et cetera. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any further business? Okay, Chair recognizes the uh, Chair Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee adjournment. Motion before the committee is on adjournment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those, please say no. We're adjourned.